We just stepped on their face with a hot nail boot and broke their nose. We just crushed their face. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another edition of the Glory UGA Podcast, brought to you by the great people at Alumni Hall. I am Tyler, and I've got a special film session edition of the Glory UGA Podcast for you guys today. It's been a minute, guys. It's been a minute since we've done one of these episodes. Probably, I'd say, at least a couple of months. We definitely did some last offseason, last summer, leading into the 2023 football season. Didn't Then once we got into the season, I know that the video stuff went MIA. just kind of got overwhelmed with things, but we're back at it, guys. And uh, we're going to make this a far more regular occurrence during the summer months leading into the 2024 season. But today, specifically, I'm going to go to the tape to illustrate why Stanford transfer tight end Benjamin Urosik is the secret weapon to the 2024 Georgia offense. And by extension, maybe the secret weapon to the entire 2024 Georgia football team that not enough people, I think outside and also within the Georgia fan base, are talking about this offseason. Back on February 9th, that's when this all went down, guys. February 9th, the Georgia football program received what I believe was big news when Benjamin Urosik elected to transfer to Georgia for his final season of collegiate eligibility. But the reaction from the Georgia fan base, by and large, I also think the larger college football world, was, was rather muted, at least relative to what I thought the reaction should be based on how I felt about Benjamin Urosi. Because as I said on the Glory J podcast, immediately after the announcement, Urosi is a big-time player, guys. And I think he should be considered, going into fall camp here in a couple of months, I think he should be considered the favorite to replace Brock Bowers, the legendary Brock Bowers, as the mover tight end, the starting mover tight end in the Georgia offense. Now, For those of you who have been listening to this podcast going back years and years and the last couple of months, you know how I felt about Benjamin Urosik. I've made that pretty clear over the past couple of months. But for those of you who are new to the podcast, and I know we have some newer listeners out there, especially some of you out there on YouTube. I appreciate you guys being here. But for those of you new to the podcast, here is actually exactly what I said about Urosik two days after his commitment. This is the first episode that I I put out there right after his commitment. So this was February 11th. You can go back and find this on Spotify. You can find this on Apple Pod, wherever you get our podcast. And you can check this out. You can you can verify me, guys. So the, the, the title of the episode was UGA Hoops, Tourney Hopes Are Dead, plus what transfer tight end Benjamin Rostick brings to Georgia. So take a listen. Here's what I had to say. I don't even know if he's really now a true mover tight end. So I think that's why you bring this guy, because that is what Urosic is. Like He is a straight-up, legit mover hybrid tight end. He's not Brock Bowers. Let's go ahead and get that out of the way. He is not Brock Bowers, because no one is Brock Bowers. That dude is as rare as it gets. So no one should expect Brock Bowers-esque production. That's not what you're going to see. But saying that, I also would caution you, don't expect this guy just to be a depth piece. Don't think that this is just a guy that we're bringing over from Stanford to sit on the bench and just kind of back up these guys in case somebody gets injured. No, 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 no. This guy is legit. So, yeah, I've been on this guy since day one, literally the day that he announced he was transferring to Georgia. And that was really, at the time, the immediate reaction was just based on what I had seen from Urosic watching a couple of Stanford games over the years. And look, I watch a ton of college football. I'm a college football junkie. Obviously, Georgia football is where my heart is. That's my passion in life. But I love college football, guys. I watch a ton of college football around the country. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm I'm an expert on Stanford football, but I watch a lot of football, whether it's Pac-12, what the artist formerly known as the Pac-12, Big Ten, SEC, ACC, Big 12, whatever, Mountain West. I love it all, guys. Sunbelt, I watch it all, Mac, all that stuff. So I've seen a, a number of Stanford games over the past couple of years. And so I was familiar with the name Benjamin Urosik when it first it leaked out you know, a couple of months ahead that, hey, this guy might be looking at Georgia. Georgia and Texas seem to be the, the two options, the, the two leaders in his transfer recruitment. So I was pumped just to hear that we were in it. And then once we landed him, I was very, very excited because I had seen him play a couple of games. So that initial reaction was just based on that. But here, here's the thing, guys. Now with some time to digest it, to really dive into the tape even more so than what I had seen from him you know, prior to the announcement, the more I dive into it, the more I am convinced that Jurassic will be a difference maker for the Georgia 2024 offense. I truly be- believe that, guys. The more and more I see, the more and more I believe that. But I also know that, at least I feel like, 
I am in the minority in terms of just how high I am on Urosic. And look, I'm not saying that people think he's a bum. That's not what I'm trying to suggest. I just think the average Georgia fan, at least those that I interact with here, living in Athens, working in Athens, running a Georgia podcast, the average Georgia fan that I come across, they think he's a good player. Like, oh yeah, like he, he's a nice piece to add. But they don't view him like I do because I view him in very, very, very high esteem. So that's why, at least as far as I'm concerned, I feel like the reaction is muted to landing a guy like Benjamin Yoss based on how good I think this player actually is. And, you know, I get it, and I don't get it at the same time. I don't know if that makes any sense. Let me try to explain. On one hand, I do understand why people are like, huh, okay, shoulder shrug, Benjamin Yoss, okay, whatever. He's, he's a tight end from Stanford. In Stanford, I, I don't know if you guys have been paying much attention because why would you pay attention to Stanford? They've been uh, really bad for a couple of years now. I mean, they, they moved on from their head coach, and then they got a new guy in there, and, like, they're still terrible. They're not a good football program. And I also think, I, I mean, I know most Georgia fans don't watch a lot of Stanford football. I get it. It comes on late, and if you're going to watch Pac-12 football, if you're going to watch the artist form known as Pac-12 After Dark, you're probably going to watch much Stanford because they haven't been good. There was, a, there was a little bit of a window there where they were kind of okay, but actually pretty good for a while, but that – Seems a long, long time ago. So I get why Georgia fans aren't watching him. If you're not watching Stanford, you're not familiar with who this guy is. And you hear his name. Okay, it's a guy that's transferring from Stanford. How good could he possibly be if he's been at Stanford for the last couple of years? And also, I, I will say beyond just the fan base and not watching Stanford, I don't think that he was promoted as one of the top players in the transfer portal when he did enter the portal. I think a large part of that also goes back to the fact that he played at Stanford. Also, last year, he was banged up. He missed about half the year with injuries. So there's that. So I, I get that part of it. Also, we have a loaded tight end room. I think that's a part of it. People look at our tight end room. Look at guys like Oscar Delp, Lawson, Lucky Pierce, Berlin, obviously not, no longer able to continue to play. But you look at the guys we brought in this year with Riddell, with Heinrich. We have an extraordinarily talented tight end room. We recruit that tight end position better than anyone in the country on a year-in and year-out basis. So when you look at the, the talent that we currently have on roster in that room, the guys that we are much more familiar with, and then you see, okay, this guy's coming over from Stanford, but I don't think we really need him that much. And, like, I mean, is he really better than Lawson Lucky? Is he better than Oscar Delp? Is he better than Jaden Riddell? Is he better than these guys? I think that has a part to do it. So I do get why the reaction might be, I think, underwhelmed about, about laying this transfer. But on the other hand, and those of you who have been listening to this podcast for a long time, I've thrown this stat out several times. It's not new to you, but I know that, again, we do have some newer listeners. So I'll throw this out to you guys. I don't know if everyone's familiar with this. But Benjamin Urosic, I know he plays out on the West Coast. He plays for Stanford. He's in, like, Nowhereville, USA. He's been there for a while, at least in terms of college football, the college football world. But Urosic has very quietly been nothing but stellar for Stanford. In fact, there's only three tight ends, three tight ends over the past three seasons. Your roster's going to his fourth year. Only three tight ends during his entire college career that have put up more than the 1,300 plus yards that your roster has amassed during the first three years of his career. You wonder who those guys are? Take a guess, guys. Yeah, Brock Bowers, nailed that one. Michael Mayer, second round draft pick, highly, highly gifted guy at Notre Dame. And then Dalton Kincaid, who's also now starting for the Buffalo Bills. That's three dudes. Three dudes that you all know. You know Brock Bowers. You know Michael Mayer. You know Dalton Kincaid now. Those are the only three tight ends in the entire country that have put up more yards than Benjamin Urosic through the first three years of his career, the last three years. And by the way, that was also with a dreadfully bad Stanford offense. And last year, he didn't, he played, he, again, he missed half the year last year. And when he was playing, their quarterback situation was a complete dumpster fire. It was absolutely garbage for them. So he's still been able to put up those kind of numbers considering that context. And those numbers, like to me, those numbers tell you his transfer should at least be generating more excitement than it has. Just the numbers alone. But it's far more than just the numbers, guys. The numbers should get you excited. Sure, I, I certainly believe that. Like what I just told you guys, does that not get you excited? Only three tight ends last three years have put up more yards than him. And those three tight ends, Brock Bowers, Michael Mayer, Dalton Kincaid, that should get you excited. That should get the juices flowing. But when you turn on the tape, that should get you downright fired up about this guy. Because you will see on tape immediately exactly what I am telling you right now. This guy can play. You'll see why I think he can be the secret weapon for the Georgia offense in 2024. Because what you see on tape 
is an extremely versatile athletic tight end that, to be quite honest with you guys, can do everything that we asked Brock Bowers to do in our offense over the past three seasons. And that is what I want to illustrate for you guys with today's film session. But we'll get to the tape in just a moment. But first, real quickly, let me clarify this. I always feel like I have to throw this out there because people want to take my words, and twist them, and say, oh, dude, you're such a homer. You're like, you think this guy's going to be as good as Brock Bowers? No, let me go ahead and just get ahead of that. I am not telling you that Benjamin Urosik is going to be as good as Brock Bowers. If you've been listening to this podcast for any amount of time, you know how I feel about Brock Bowers. I think he is the, he, I've told you guys, he's the, in my generation, he is the GOAT. The GOAT Georgia football player of my generation. I was not around for Herschel Walker. I know the legend of Herschel Walker. I didn't get to see that guy play. So I just go with what everyone else says. Look at the numbers. Look at the accomplishments. All of that. Heisman Trophy winner, national championship. All of that. But in my generation, we've had a ton of great players in the world. The Chubbs of the world. The Gurleys of the world. The AJ Greens of the world. We've had a ton of big-time players over the years. We haven't had a guy like that. He is the greatest Georgia football player of my generation over the last 35 or so years. I don't want to age myself too much. But yeah, over the last 35 plus years, we'll go there. So I'm not telling you he's Brock Bowers, okay? Brock is a legend. He is like, Yurosuke is not Brock Bowers. Brock is a different level. I, I often say that I think the term generational is thrown around way too liberally, but I will throw it around here. I think Brock Bowers is a generational player. We've never seen a guy like that at Georgia. At, at that position, and I don't think that we ever will see a guy exactly like Brock Bowers. I mean, it might take another generation or so, so I truly believe that. But while he might not be Brock Bowers, what I'm going to illustrate for you is that that does not mean that we cannot use Benjamin Urosic in a very similar way to how we use Brock Bowers over the past three years. He can do all of the things that Brock did in our offense. He just might not do it quite to the level that Brock Bowers did it. But hey, you know, saying that, I mean, that, that's no son of the guy. He can still do it at far high enough of a level for our, our offense to not skip a beat in this post Brock Bowers era that we are about to head into. So let's go ahead and do it, guys. Let's dive in the tape and let me show you exactly what I am talking about. All right, guys, we're going to start off with what is a, a very simple, basic play, but it, it is a core play within our offensive system. At least it has been the last couple of years. Really, Todd Munkin came in. He's the one that really implemented this and started using this heavily. Mike Bobo, obviously spending a year under Todd Munkin, took this, and he ran with it, used a ton of it this year as well. We call this play toothpick within our program. I don't know the the genesis of the name toothpick and why we call it toothpick, but that's what we call it. The toothpick player within our offense is this guy. It is the H-back tight end. In this case, this is Brock Bowers. This is an RPO, all right? And so we, we call a run play, but we have this RPO, this toothpick RPO tagged to it. So what Brock is going to do, the toothpick player, he is going to, at the snap of the ball, he is going to come across the formation behind line of scrimmage. Carson Beck has a very simple RPO read. He is reading this man, the end man on the line of scrimmage. And this guy has really two options. Either he is going to crash on the handoff, on the uh, the handoff to the running back, or he is going to see Brock Bowers coming in motion and say, man, Brock's got a lot of passes that I've seen on tape, so maybe let me just hesitate for a second, maybe chip him, or just kind of pay attention to what Brock Bowers is doing. If he hesitates, then we pull it, okay? Uh, or then we hand off. So it's, it's really one of two things. If this guy crashes on the run, then Carson's going to pull it, and he's going to toss it to Brock. He's going to pass it to him, who's out here in the flat. We're going to have these guys blocking right here, right here, okay? If this guy hesitates for a second and doesn't immediately crash down from the backside, then Carson is going to hand the ball off to the running back, and we're running. It could be an inside zone. It could be duo, a couple of different things that we could run. But we run this play all the time. I know you saw us run this play over and over and over again, not just last year, but the past couple years. Brock Bowers has made an art form out of this. So you're going to see here. So this is an RPO, and I'm going to show you why I know it's an RPO in this case. It's very simple, guys. If you wonder, like, is this really an RPO, or is it just a play action, call, design, pass? Watch the offensive line. Watch these guys right here. If they are firing out and blocking run and we throw the ball, it's an RPO, right? They don't know this, that we're going to throw the ball. It's, it's a call to run play and we have an RPO tagged to it. If, however, they take a step back like into their pass sets and we 
fake you the running back and then throw it, then that's a design play action, an old school play action pass that we designed to throw it from the get go. So that's what you have to look for. Just watch the offensive line. If they're blocking out, if they're firing out of their stances, blocking ahead, either two, three yards down the field, and they throw the ball, it's an RPO. If not, then it's a play action pass. But I got a couple examples here of us running this two pick play. And you're going to see Brock come behind the line of scrimmage. Let's watch it play out. So we're this guy in motion. We got one blocker over here. And that's first down. Stay ahead of the chains, right? And let's watch right here also. Let's pay attention to what this defensive end is going to be doing. This end man line of scrimmage right here. Watch him. Let's see what he does here. He is going to crash. Actually, take it back. It wasn't that guy. In this case, we're reading this linebacker. And watch what he is going to do right here on this particular play. So when he crashes the way that he does, really the, both those guys, that end man, that defensive end, and the linebacker, that's an easy read for Carson. Now this next play, now remember I just told you about RPO versus play action? There's a reason I told you that. Because this play, I would argue, I think this is a called play a call play action pass to Brock because look at the offensive line. No one's firing out. They're all taking a step back. Like th this is a design play action pass. We are calling this pass to Brock in the huddle because look at the look at the situation, guys. It is 10-0 early in the first quarter on the road. Carson Beck's first star. He's struggling to open the game or in his first road start. We need to get something going offensively. So when Georgia the past three years has needed to get something going offensively, who do we go to? Oh, yeah, the greatest tight end in college football history, Brock Bowers. And that's what we're doing here. Because sometimes the defense, when it's an RPO, they can dictate what you're doing. Like Even like old school like zone, quarterback zone reads. One thing defense can do to respond to that is they can dictate. If we don't want the ball in Brock Bowers' hands, then we're just going to dictate that it's a run read for you. Well, we didn't want that to happen. We want to get the ball into our best player's hands. So Mike Bobo, got to give him credit here. He knows that we need to get the ball in Brock's hands, so he says, screw it. We're not even going to call an RPO. We're going to have it look like the, the classic toothpick RPO that we run a lot of, but we're just going to throw this to Brock Bowers. But you still get the idea. It's still the same look, the same presentation of toothpick that with the R as an RPO, but just not actually with the RPO. It's more just a call, play, action shot. But you can see a play out here. But again, second and short, you want to keep the chains moving here. Try to get some points on the board. Boom. Right here, second and 10. We want to get some yards, right? So give us a shot for third and short, third and medium. And again, let's look at this guy right here, this outside linebacker that we're reading. And there's, the, the read can differ, guys. It can be the in-man line of scrimmage. It could also be if like a linebacker steps out here uh, before the snap. It's going to end up being this guy. So if we can watch the guy, we're going to read him. This guy right here. This is the dude now that's becoming the in-man line of scrimmage. And so Carson's going to read him. You're going to see he's going to crash on the running back, which is an easy read. For Carson's to dump it off to Brock, Brock's now in space, and Brock's going to do what Brock was always apt to do in the red and black. But to run this play, you can run that technically with anybody. You could put an old school fullback back there. You could put a 300-pounder back there just to catch the ball. But we need someone that not only just catches the ball for like a one or two-yard game, we need someone that can do these kind of things that can make guys miss and turn a, a two-yard pass into a 20-yard game. And Benjamin Ross, like, while he's not Brock Bowers, he's not going to break tackles and just power through people the way Brock Bowers does. You see right here, this is Stanford's version toothpick. Get the guy the ball in space, and he is plenty athletic enough to make things happen. Now, this next play that I'm going to go over is a sister play to toothpick. We call this floss. Okay, it's the same concept. You're going to see Brock Bowers... Tied in, lined up in an H-back roll. But remember with Toothpick, what he's doing is he's coming across the line of scrimmage, behind line of scrimmage at the snap. With Floss, it's not it, it's it's the same idea. It's an RPO, but you're not coming behind line of scrimmage. He's lined up here, and instead of coming back across the line of scrimmage, he's very simply going to flare out right here. So he's lined up in this case with Floss. He's lined up on the same side as running back. The play still, if, if we hand it off, the run play is still going here. With Toothpick, Brock would have been lined up right there. And he comes across line of scrimmage. Well, Floss, we just go ahead and line him up over here. And we we probably actually ran this play this past year under Bobo. We ran Floss more than we ran Toothpick in my estimation. I don't have all the numbers. But it certainly seemed that way. And going back and putting this tape together, it certainly seemed that way as well. 
But let's go ahead and watch this play out. Same concept. We are going to read the in-man line of scrimmage. If he crashes, Carson's going to pull it, and he's going to throw it to Brock. If he kind of stays out there with Brock, head stays for a second, we have this guy accounted for. Because really what, what Toothpick and Floss allow us to do, it allows us to get the numbers advantage of the box. Because we can account for this guy without actually having to block him. It's old school option football. We're optioning off him. So you can take him out of the equation without actually having to utilize one of your blockers to block him. That frees up the guys that you have blocking to go block other players, thereby giving you that plus one advantage in the box, which is huge. That's huge in, in what in a college football in general now, but certainly in what we do offensively. But let's go ahead and watch this one play out. This is floss. Run read. Carson pulls it. And what you have here, there's all typically there's going to be a guy that Brock's gonna have to beat, right? So you're gonna have, I think this is Rara Thomas San Jose. He's got this dude right here. He's gonna block him. Now this guy is unblocked. Brock's gonna make him miss. And we know what Brock Bowers did. He consistently made those guys miss. So Benjamin Ross will have to be able to do that as well. And I will show you on, on a clip here in a minute why I think that he can certainly do those things. But again, let's just watch that play out. So this guy's unblocked, but no worries. Brock's just going to, well, typically make a miss. That one's a rare Brock fumble. Same concept here, right? Floss. Now that was with 12 minutes ago in the in the quarter. And so Brock had, we have what 15 yard gain right there. A minute and 15 seconds later, we're going to come right back to it. Same game, same quarter, second quarter. Here Brock is again, H back, line up the same side as the running back right here. And we're reading this dude right here. He's looking at the running back. Carson reads that, says, all right, it's time to toss it to Brock. we got this guy blocking here. This dude, once again, going to be one-on-one. -on -one, and Brock is just going to do what Brock does and make people miss and create big plays out of, a, out of a, what would be otherwise a two-yard game. Get off me. That's Brock Bowers for you. Here's another one. Same concept there. Short gain, but when you have an athletic tight end like Brock Bowers who can make people miss, you take a two-yard gain, you turn it into a 10, 15-yard game. And here's your Rossick. Again, this is Stanford's offense, but same concept. Might not be exactly how we call it, but he's not up there in an H-back roll. You get the read in your face. Throw it out to him. Make a miss. Boom, makes a guy miss. Not like Brock, different than Brock, but you take a, a one, two-yard game and you turn second and 10 now into third and one. That is case in point in how Benjamin Arasica can do the same things that Brock does within our offense and allow us to still run our offense the same that we, way that we have the past couple of years. All right, next up here, this is just going to be a simple rail route, a wheel route, whatever you want to call it. We ran this a lot with Brock, especially out of condensed formations, a tight bunch of sets. Just another way to create an explosive play with the best player on the field. It looks like they're kind of in a cover two here. You got a guy sitting in the flats. The safety of the top looks like cover two, based on the angle that we can see. We don't get the all 22, but he hit the honey spot there. Boom. Brock down in space. Brock makes things happen. We saw that over and over again last year. And you can see Rossick, similar concept. Run the rail route. Up the seam there. Big game for Stanford. Rossick, again, can do the same things that Brock was able to do within our offense. Now, this was maybe the play of the season, one of them. Brock Bowers just taking over the fourth quarter. You guys remember this play, right? And I'm showing this play. This is a dig route, but it's 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 a crossing route. It's not an over route. It's a dig route. But Brock takes the ball from one side of the field, catches it coming across the field, and then the catch and run after the, after the catch is ridiculous, the yak. But here is Benjamin Rossick doing something very similar. And guys, this is not San Jose State that Benjamin Rossick did that against. This is Notre Dame that Benjamin Roska is running away from. So when I tell you this guy is a high-level athlete at that position, I'm telling you he's a high-level athlete. Not Brock Bowers. Again, I I, I, I want to keep emphasizing that because I don't want anyone to sit here and say, you think he's going to be good as Brock Bowers? No, that's not what I'm telling you. I'm just telling you he can do the same things within our offense that Brock Bowers did. Now, this is just Brock crazy body control. This is Brock as a freshman. We saw this time and time again. The body contortion, the body control out of this world for Brock Bowers. And I'm not going to tell you that Benjamin Rossick is quite the level athlete that Brock is. I don't believe that he is. But again, you're going to see in this next clip here, he can do the same things. 
maybe not quite that level, but at a really high level, contorting his body. I know, guys, I know the, the tape here, it's not super clear, it's kind of blurry, but you can see that there, right? Contorting your body, falling away, defender draping your body, tough contested catch, and you make that catch. Those are big time plays. In this screen game, how often do we use Brock Bowers in screen game, guys? Whether it's middle screens, whether it's quick little now screens, a variety of ways we got him involved in the screen game. Because when you get a guy like Brock, as athletic and powerful as he is, as tough as he is after the catch, you get this guy in space, get the ball in his hands, he's going to make things happen. I, mean, I know that we lost this game. I know this isn't a losing effort, but what a play by Brock there. Just had to throw that one in there. But here's Jurassic, middle screen. Again, just like Brock, get the ball in space to this guy. He's going to make things happen for you. Now, this right here is just showing Brock's ability to make the tough, ridiculous, contested catch. We kind of showed that earlier with the body control. This is not so much about body control. This is about hands. Just throwing out your paw and bringing in a one-handed pass in a critical situation. We saw this, what, a couple times? A couple times in a row against Auburn. One of them didn't count, which was a very unfortunate. But still, the fact remains, Brock can do those things. Well, Jurassic might not be able to do it quite to that level, as I keep saying, but you'll see right here, what Jurassic, no scrub himself with a one-handed catch there, contested catch against, again, Notre Dame. Big time play right there. And then you got this the old school play action. We used to call this back in my day, like when I was seven, eight years old, when I played a little tight end back in the day, we used to call this tight end dump. Now, obviously we have much more advanced terminology for these plays nowadays, but this concept's still very sim simple. You uh, establish the run game. You get everybody attacking the line of scrimmage when you have a play fake. Look what these linebackers are, right? Then you got Brock right here in this void, in the open space that that creates. You just t simply toss the ball off to him. This is, a, this is the game that we just destroyed South Carolina back in 2022. And once you get in the ball in that kind of space, we know what Brock Bowers does with the football when he gets that kind of room to operate. He's on taking the distance. God, this play just never gets old. Just watching Brock do these things, man, it breaks my heart, man, that we'll never get to see him do this in the red and black again. But, hey, man, it was incredible while it lasted. But certainly that was far from the only time we saw that. Got a couple more clips here. You're going to see him do it against Kentucky. But we got to watch this one more time. Just look at this man go. That was a great game to be at. Talk, they always talk a bunch of trash, and we shut him up real quick like we are always apt to do. Same thing here against Kentucky. Here it is one more time. Now he's playing inline right here. A little play fake. Linebackers hesitate. Up the seam. Touchdown. That's old school tight end football, right? But it's still effective. And Brock can certainly do those things. He did those things for us over and over again. And Yoros, as you're going to see here in a minute, can also do those things. Again, like linebackers, they don't really bite too much, but the split second hesitation creates that room. And here's Yorosik. Very similar concept. Play action fake down the seam. Making things happen. All right, now this one, this is also another function that tight ends have to play. Like, they have to be able to function in this regard. When you're, not every play is going to be a home run play. Like, Brock had plenty of them. But sometimes you just need to be that possession receiver. You, when you see a zone defense just sitting down the zone, finding that soft spot, presenting your, your body as a target to the, to the quarterback, giving him your numbers, and then making plays. And just keep the chains moving, right? Keep us ahead of the chains, keep the chains moving. Brock did that time and time and time again as you can see in all these examples. But here's Jurassic, same concept. See here in his own, finds that window, shows his numbers to the quarterback, tight window, makes a contested catch, keep those chains rolling on third and three. And then of course, one of the things that made Brock Bowers unique is the ability to actually just function as a running back, even though he's a tight end. He did this so many times for us, multiple touchdowns throughout his career. But as wild as it seems, you're awesome. can do the same things, guys. Do you see it? You see what I'm talking about here? Like, I'm not telling you he's Brock Bowers, but here he is doing the exact same things that we asked Brock Bowers to do in our offense and does it at a high level. So now do you kind of get what I'm saying? Do you see my point here? As you can clearly see, I think I tried to make it as clear as possible for you. This dude can play. Benji Narosic is the real deal. This guy can absolutely play and he can do everything within our offense that Brock Bowers did for us the past three seasons. Again, maybe not quite at Brock's level, but still at an extremely high level regardless. And that is big for this 2024 Georgia football team. Having versatile players like that at tight end, is, it's just such a critical component 
to what we do offensively from a schematic standpoint, from just a, a philosophical core standpoint of what our offense is. You guys know how we recruit the tight end position. That doesn't happen by accident. Yes, Todd Hartley is a dude, man. He's an incredible recruiter. The guy's a machine out there recruiting tight ends. But he also has a lot of help. The message that we can send tight ends is, hey, here's how we're going to use you. Here's how we view this position in our offense. It is a premium position for us. Quarterbacks always got to be the number one position because, I mean, it's the most important position on any football team. If you don't have a quarterback, you're not going to win a championship. It's just that simple. So you got to have a quarterback. But in our offense... I mean, the tight end position, guys, structurally, it allows us to do what we want to do offensively and to build our offense the way that we want to, be, to build it, to be as physical a team as, as we like to be, as Kirby Smart really demands that we be. That we, and we, and we'll, it's clear, guys, we place an extremely high value on that tight end position because what it does is it, that position, having multiple players at tight end, allowing us to run 12 personnel at times, 13, we haven't done that as much recently. Back in 21, we did it quite a bit, at least more than we have in recently, but being able to run 12 personnel 50 plus percent of the time, that allows us to consistently put defenses in conflicts on a down by down basis. And that creates mismatches that we can exploit in a variety of ways. It's just, it's just so simple, guys. I mean, schematically, if we have two tight ends on the field, 12 personnel, the defense is now in conflict. When those two tight ends are like Oscar Delp and Brock Bowers or Oscar Delp and Benjamin Rossick, maybe Oscar Delp and Lost and Lucky, when you have two tight ends that can function effectively as blockers but also are dynamic athletes that can pose significant threats to a defense in the passing game, that puts defenses in conflict because in 12 personnel, if they don't match with heavy defensive personnel, we can run the football right down your throat. That's exactly what we will do. But then when you respond with heavy personnel defensively, well, what are we going to do? Well, now we've got you right where we want you in the passing game. Now you've got bigger guys. You've got you have guys that don't operate as well in space trying to cover Brock Bowers, trying to cover Oscar Delp, trying to cover Benjamin Urosic. And all those guys can effectively operate as receivers if we wanted them to. Like, that is what these guys do for our offense. It is critical, critical to what we do structurally, philosophically within the Georgia offense. And that's, you know, it's not, and it's not that we don't already have talented tight ends. And I, that's the pushback I get when I talk about this sometimes. Like, dude, like, we don't really need this guy. Like, we've got great tight ends. Yeah, we do. I'm not arguing that we don't. But Oscar Delp, who I love, by the way, I love Oscar Delp. I think he can do more for us in the passing game than he has been. I think like, coming into college, I thought Oscar Delp was a mover tight end type guy. He was. That's what he was. That's what he did in high school. But we've added weight to him, and we've kind of penciled him in. Like We've basically cultivated him to play that inline tight end role that Darnell Washington played. Now, he's different than Darnell. He's more athletic, but not as big. We know that he certainly improved dramatically as the season progressed last year as a blocker. And when you invest that much time in developing him as an inline tight end, you have to imagine that's the role that we are going to probably still play him in primarily this year, although I think he could, he could do some mover tight end stuff. And then you have Lawson Lucky, who's very talented. I'm very high on Lawson Lucky. Me saying that I'm high on Benjamin Rossi doesn't mean that I think Lawson Lucky is a bum. And, and that's what I, I hear from some people. When I talk about how, how high I am on your Rossi, they're like, are you, are, they, are you not high on Lawson Lucky? No, I am. I think Lawson Lucky is going to be really, really good for us. But with your Rossi, we have a guy that has been, again, as productive as just about any tight end not named Brock Bowers, Michael Mayer, or Dalton Kincaid over the last three years, that kind of experience and production, that speaks for itself. Like, I believe in Lawson Lucky. I think Lawson can be really good, but he's young. We, do you want to be in a position where you have to count on that? Like, maybe he would be that guy. Maybe. That'd be incredible. But we have this guy in your roster now. If, if that dude wants to come to Georgia, in no universe can you possibly say no. You say, oh, yeah, we're going to make room. Because that dude is legit. I just showed you guys, and he is a perfect fit for what we need in this post Brock Bowers era. And Lost Lucky will play a lot. Again, I'm not down on Lost and Lucky, but I just, I'm that high on Benjamin Urosic because he's been asked to do it, guys. He's done it. He's done the things that we need him to do, that, that we had Brock do in our offense. And he's been able to put defenses in conflict, and he's going to be able to do that even more so in our offense with the weapons that he has around him as well, like all the guys the receiver, the, the quarterback, all of that. So that's why, guys, all of those reasons. That is why I believe that Benjamin Rossi can be the secret weapon to the 2024 Georgia offense.
But all right, guys, I appreciate you checking out this episode. I hope you enjoyed this. We'll have a lot more of these film sessions for you guys over the next couple of weeks and months throughout the summer months leading into the 2024 season. So keep on coming back for more. Make sure you check out the Glory UJ podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Whether that's Spotify, Apple Pie, Google Play, wherever. It's there for you guys. We'll have multiple episodes every single week, and we'll have you guys covered for your Georgia football fix leading into the 2024 season. So appreciate you guys. Make sure you like and subscribe. Comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts, guys. Certainly love to hear from you guys. But yeah, thank you for being here. I'm Tyler. And of course, as always, go dogs. Man, is there going to be some property destroyed tonight. 26 to 21. Dogs on top.